Well, this is uh, week three of the course, and this week we're examining roles scientists play in environmental management. Uh, Bill Dennison uh, gave you a session on uh, the, the dynamic of the change of environmental science from problem identification to problem solution, a bit of the history of evolution of, of scientific thinking and process and, and, the, and social arrangements that we make as scientists. What I'd like to do today is to really think about this. We know that environmental management is a complex and challenging uh, task. How might scientists and technical analysts be most effective in its implementation? This discussion will focus on what we know about the process of scientific advising, what drives decisions, uh, is scientific advising tru truly objective or can it be, and how might it be more effective? It's going to be based on some literature, which you're probably unfamiliar with, because it's based in the social sciences and political science. So scientists who've actually studied science and studied scientists and, and the roles they play and the impact they have. I'll provide a, a realistic framework, hopefully, about how scientific knowledge is used in making decisions and formulating policies. So we can think about this as we reflect in the various specific case studies considered during the course. There are some key readings that I've, I've asked you to look at. Uh, so Bill talked about Pasteur's quadrant, in which we can think of this uh, in a two-by-two uh, uh, two table in which we have on one uh, dimension in which the, which the focus in, in is really on quest for fundamental uh, understanding without application of that work. So think of Niels Bohr, the famous Danish uh, physicist, uh, you know, who advanced uh, quantum mechanics and, and particle physics, uh, really driven by the basic understanding without, a, without any kind of real notion of practical application. On the bottom right, we see Thomas Edison, who really wasn't that big a fan of science. He was really interested in using the scientific information to make products and do things to better society and make himself wealthy actually as well. And uh, also uh, the individual here to epitomize this quadrant which you are really oriented towards basic scientific understanding but also its practical application is Louis Pasteur. Uh, Pasteur made enormous uh, uh, advances in basic science with respect to uh, microbiology and the, infect, the microbial infections related to disease, but he also uh, was saved many lives. Was really interested in in, um, in advancing public health. Think think pasteurization, for example. So one of the things that's important to do as scientists is to understand where the other people are coming from. The people we're trying to provide information to. The people we're trying to help make effective decisions. The policymakers. So I did this table a few years ago, uh, and it helps try to help scientists understand the cultural differences. I won't go into great detail. You can reflect on them. It's simple enough. But think about the valued action. You know, we're all about research and scholarship. That's what we're awarded in the scientific profession, particularly in academia, whereas policymakers are focused on legislation, regulation, decision. They don't care about how many peer-reviewed published papers you published. The time frames are different. Our goals are to increase understanding. Theirs are to manage present problems. Uh, our goals are, uh, the basis of our decisions are scientific evidence. And they think scientific evidence is important, but there's also values, public opinion, and economic considerations to bring into bear. Uh, we focus on details. They focus on the broad outlines. We think, uh, in our worldview, things have to be operate to be consistent with biophysical mechanisms. They think, yeah, that's important too, but we have to think of the political, social, and economic mechanisms as well. I like this uh, uh, simple diagram because it shows you, uh, first of all, that scientists, like lay people, really have no real power in, in our social systems, no res responsibility for the outcomes in a way. Uh, but as we go up in the, the chain of uh, higher political responsibility and, and power uh, from a professional analyst, the point is, is that e at each step, uh, the science, the, these folks have less, they're less grounded necessarily by the truth as defined by their peers and by these other factors that we talked about from, a, from an analyst to an administrator to a politician. So a politician is really no more guided by truth defined by peers as a layperson. 
That's why we can have alternative facts and things of this sort. Uh, and we recognize, we should recognize there as the power goes up, there's this less focus on truth guided by, got, got truth and evidence. Kai uh, Lee, uh, who's put this figure together, would say, well, you know, the, the, obviously the best position to be in, to, to have someone who's guided by truth, but also has lots of power. And that's, of course, the, you know, philosopher kings that we've had in history. Uh, and of course, our society doesn't have those anymore, and we're not going to have them. So uh, Kai uh, Lee kind of gets us, helps us to think about it this way. So we need to think that scientists providing advice don't work. It's a team sport, really. And that we, the way this works is not just individual scientists, but groups of scientists. So one way, of course, is, is the, the, the power of consensus, where there's a scientific consensus uh, that can't be easily uh, denied. So uh, Peter Haas, who invented this concept, uh, had, did his early work on the Mediterranean Sea, where you would have expected that because of the great uh, social, religious, political differences north to south between Southern Europe, the Middle East, and Northern Africa, uh, that it would be very difficult for these nations to come to agreement on almost anything. That's kind of the, the, that's the, the assumptions based on policy, based on political science. So that's the system that we, political system that we think about. But what he found was that they came to an agreement on a Mediterranean action plan to improve the quality of the Mediterranean because the scientists were, they had this strong scientific consensus among their national scientists. Many of these scientists had been trained in Southern Europe. You know, they, they, they had, you know, a focus on many of the, the values that we hold dear in science. And so they came to consensus and basically forced these North-South nations, Muslim, Christian, uh, uh, democracies uh, and those that weren't to, to come to an agreement on this because that's what the that's what the scientists were were were, uh, were saying. On the other hand, the North Sea, common culture, good you know of scientific culture, good common political culture, and and Haas uh, in his analysis said the similar agreement in the North Sea, science really didn't have that much of an effect. It really was the political dynamics between the more progressive nations, Denmark and Germany, who were into the green movement, uh, that really prevailed uh, and forced the laggard nations, the UK in particular, to come along with the, with the agreement. It wasn't driven by science, it was driven by those political dynamics. So another way in which we work in groups is not with just among scientists, but among people who we, others we work with. So you can imagine, we, um, we know people who work in the agencies, uh, who are policy makers, uh, who come from the various sectors that are involved, fishermen, are, uh, for example, and even journalists that we talk to and work with, and what Sabatje calls advocacy coalitions. So scientists work through these coalitions because we share the same basic beliefs and critical perceptions, causal relationships, and the common goals. And it's really through this that there, we can be powerful as scientists. Well, whether you believe uh, in that epi in epi the power of epistemic communities or advocacy, co advocacy coalitions, personally, I think they both are important. The fact is the role scientists play have both professional and normative, that is, value decisions, and that the thought that we are just independent, pure, driven snow scientists who are just giving you the truth, it has to be thought through. So this idea of the independence, the autonomous domain of science here, it's called the realist view, in which we're clearly separated from social interference and political power uh, and that our duty as experts is to bring just the facts to bear on the processes of political evaluation and to keep public actions from falling prey to passion and irrationality. Um, that, uh, this, and, and our real positivism, the logical positivism, is really based upon uh, the principles and values of science itself, experiments, uh, basic research, peer review, has to be moderated. Uh, based on what we just mentioned. And a person who's written quite a bit about this is Sheila Jasanoff, a political scientist. 
And so she takes, she defines what we might call a radical relativist view that has to moderate this realistic view, realist view of science as this separate enterprise without, without you know, polluted, not polluted by, by human values. So it's based on the notion that science really must achieve moral as well as epistemological, that is, you know, evidence-based authority. It requires that scientific discourse and political discourse be put into a mutually sustaining relationship rather than separated. So some of the implications are we can't be expected to resolve uncertainty in our own, just as scientists, but we can only work with social actors within or within advocacy coalitions to repair that uncertainty. What is the acceptable level of uncertainty that society is prepared to, uh, uh, to, to take in? So the scientific ideas pro prove influential because they converge on the cultural ideas about responsibility and fault. They support politically acceptable forms of discor discourse and are ratified by communities that have this privileged right to set policy. Rather than the best po possible science, ask to how to achieve the moral certainty needed for real-time political decisions. Carrying this idea of scientists always having, can't be separating themselves from their own values uh, is the work of Roger Pielke, another political science scientist from the University of Colorado. Uh, and he's written extensively about this, but most importantly, I want to refer you to this book, The Honest Broker. We have an excerpt in the readings uh, for you. And he again looks at this two by two table in a little different way. He thinks of of the, the, the dimensions of this is depending on your view of democracy. Are we all about fighting to, and who, whoever has the most votes uh, can prevail? Uh, are we about, um, uh, you know, the conflict of ideas in a society that together makes collective effective decisions? And then also, how does this system, how does this work? Or, or am I as a scientist handing it off to my program manager in an agency who's advising the secretary of the agency who's advising the governor of this linear model, or is it much more complex? Do we work through these advocacy coalitions? Do the fact that I, as a scientist, talk to the media have an effect on this process? This is the stakeholder model. So <clears throat> he, he would put the role that scientists play in one of these four boxes. One pure scientist, again, think Neil, Bu Neil Bohr. Uh, yes, I'm going to just do my research. Uh, if you want to see what I've done here, I'll shove under the door reprints, and if it's useful, great. If it's not, it's my research. Uh, on the other hand, we could think of, uh, if we think of this, look, the, look at this interest group, a pluralism idea, the value of demo view of democracy, we have issue advocates. So their scientists work for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation or the National Resources Defense Council or the American Farm Bureau Federation or... Uh, you know, Constellation Energy Corporation. These are all advocating for certain positions they want to achieve, and and the role those scientists play is to make the case scientifically uh, uh, to, toward those objectives. Uh, science arbitrators uh, can help take scientific information, translate it, help people work through what it means, uh, and uh, resolve some conflicts, inconsistencies in the science. But what he argues is that we need more honest brokers, that is, scientists who work with decision makers, don't tell them what to do, but help them think through the consequences of their choices. He admits, uh, and, and I urge you, if you're interested in learning about this more, to watch this speech he gave, a 30-minute uh, speech uh, on the YouTube video. He admits that it's not as simple, that we scientists can play roles in more of these, and that the role of an honest broker is not as is, is, uh, easily compelling as we might indicate, but it's an interesting thing to, uh, to think about. So, uh, Pilkey has become, although I think this is a valuable contribution, a controversial figure because he's taken this idea of science, there's no such thing as objective science, we all have values to a high level, and he's been used, in my opinion, by the climate change denial community uh, to kind of cast doubt on a lot of uh, the objectivity of scientists. Um, and in fact, uh, Sheila Jasanoff, who we just talked about, has, a, and it's in the uh, supplemental reading, an interesting critique of Pielke's book, The Honest Broker, that if you're interested, you should look at. So finally, let me just think about, put this in the context of <laughs> the biggest issue we're talking about today, climate change. 
and I think many of you have kind of followed this in one level, one level or another. So I've just put some prominent scientists out here who are involved in these issues, uh, and I've kind of arranged them. Uh, it's not strictly linear, but from the most activist, Jim Hansen, who was uh, who was who's a, a, a lead scientist in NASA, who was uh, uh, muzzled when he was in 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 NASA and during the Bush administration, couldn't speak to Congress. And has since retired, <laughs> has become a very activist voice involved in protests, being arrested, and advocating for really dramatic uh, changes and decarbonization of our of our world. Michael Mann, now very prominent, was under intense uh, attack, uh, political attack for his work about on uh, the paleoclimatology that this hockey stick hockey stick diagram you might be aware of showing the increase in temperature uh, over longer periods of time. Now very activist, uh, very much of an activist as well. Ben Santer, who's kind of less activist uh, than that, but very sincere scientist who works on, on attribution. How do we know that the changes we're seeing can be attributed to CO2 or uh, greenhouse gas built up? Uh, works in a federal laboratory, so he's you know, susceptible um, uh, to the political uh, changes, wind, uh, political winds of change. And but yet, uh, he, he wrote a very public uh, open letter to, pre to President-elect Trump when, when uh, earlier last month uh, to urging him to pay uh, careful attention to climate change. Susan Solomon, very uh, uh, renowned uh, uh, climate, climatologist as well, who I was on a committee with, the National Academy Committee with, and she's such a purist about carefully worded and don't overstep our boundaries as scientists that we had one uh, statement that, that climate change is an urgent problem, something like that, and which he said, I can't agree to that. Urgent is just goes too far. That's putting our own values into it. So she threatened to resign from the committee. So I had the job of kind of keeping her on the, on the team. So I sought a synonym and I said, Susan, how about if it's a pressing problem? She said, oh, I can go with that. So it shows, shows you the care. Pilkey we talked about. And then uh, another person in the news recently, is Judith Curry, one of the very small number of climatologists, I mean, credential climatologists who have, you know, published papers, who's in the skeptic community, just recently announced that she was going to, she's had it with, you know, with academia and the research community. Uh, they're picking at her. And uh, so she's getting out of the academic uh, research business, but probably going to become now even more of a, uh, a uh, a voice for the skeptical community. So as Roger Pilkey says, there is no bright line that separates science from politics. We should think about that, be careful what we do, but also recognize we are part of society. We bring into our, into our process various values, and we need to be mindful of those as we try to be effective.